everybody. I hope you're all well and enjoying this as much as I enjoyed Margaret's opening contribution there where she talked about uncertainty. Now, for me, um, uncertainty is embedded in this book because I started to travel in the United States when I was a, a kid, a slip of a boy in my teens. And uh, how could I have anticipated the election of Donald J. Trump? It would have been impossible. But one couldn't have even thought that such an outcome was going to follow the half century that lay ahead. And that means that when Margaret said the quest is the point, it leads me to reflect on the nature of journalism, which is precisely that, that it is the journeying that uh, brings you new experiences. It is the knowledge that what lies ahead is uncertainty that is exciting, not the idea that you will suddenly crack it and you will find that in an American context, the perfect president is elected or whatever it is. It's that you never know what is around the corner. So this is unashamedly a journey that begins um, when I was 18 in 1970, when I did what so many uh, students, particularly in that era did, which was to work for a paltry sum in, in a menial job, in my case, quite extraordinarily, an assistant salad chef in a hotel in the Borscht Belt in the Catskill Mountains which was an experience that I don't think they enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but not because I was any good at it. Uh, but it's a summer that is etched in my mind because I began to understand what New York was. I'd never flown across the Atlantic before. In fact, I'd never been in a plane. I began to understand the diversity and the complexity of the United States. And the whole um, image of that summer has been imprinted in my mind ever since because when I left, I knew I would return. And as I left, there was a photograph taken, which I still treasure probably more than any of the others in the book, in New York Harbor. I was on the Staten Island Ferry and a friend took a picture, which I think you can see now, looking at Lower Manhattan, which is of course still so exciting. And what, I mean, apart from my strange hair, it's quite a cool shirt though, but anyway, my strange hair, what you can see behind, and I find this a most poignant scene, are the Twin Towers uncompleted. They were still being built. One is behind the other, obviously, but just over my head there. And when I see that and think of what happened in that city subsequently and the cataclysm of 2001, it leads me just to reflect on that extraordinary 50 years that I experienced. It seems remarkable looking back on it, that it was half a century, which was for me a process of learning. Of course, it had excitement, absorption in political reporting after I became a journalist in uh, 1975, having spent a year as a student in the States uh, at Syracuse University during Watergate, uh, and I managed to contrive to spend quite a bit of that time in Washington pretending with some of my colleagues who were also going to be journalists that it was a research project. Well, of course it was, but we just wanted to be in on the story. And so from the mid 70s, I began to report on things in the United States, first as a newspaper. Uh, correspondent and then eventually for the BBC from 1988 onwards and I can still remember the flavor of that first convention in 1976. I looked a bit weird and I hope you keep the picture up for a slightly shorter time than the previous one. <laughs> this was me in at Madison Square Garden in 1976 using a telephone which uh, reporters, um, some of the writers um, who are following me the evening will remember, uh, we used phones. And that was an extraordinary occasion. It was Carter's convention where he was um, nominated to fight the presidency against Jerry Ford, who had taken over from Nixon after his disgrace and the resignation of World Watergate. And the idea was that American politics would be cleaned up and that Jimmy Carter would do it. The peanut farmer, as they used to call him from Plains, Georgia, although in fact he'd been a senior officer on a nuclear submarine, but that didn't make such good headlines. I remember that convention for all kinds of reasons. I mean, standing in a, a loo off the floor, the convention floor, and discovering in this otherwise empty lavatory, standing next to me, Mayor Daly of Chicago, who to people of my generation who remember 1968 was the absolute beast, you know, the, the, the master manipulator of the great city boss. And there he was, and I couldn't think what to say, which was my first supreme journalistic failure. I remember also coming back four years later to Carter's second convention, and that extraordinary moment when Ted Kennedy, who had tried to defeat Carter for the Democratic nomination because he was fed up with him, 
uh, failed largely because of the legacy of his own personal background, the accident of Chappaquiddick in 1969, in which Mary Jo Kopechny died in his car. But he made an extraordinary speech to the convention <laughs> by a variety of chance circumstances, which I don't need to go into here. I'd ended up in the NBC radio box to do some, I don't know, comments on this occasion and find myself to my astonishment sitting next to the president's mother, Ms. Lillian Carter, aged 83, who was of course a gracious Southern lady. And I, I felt I was in very, um, uh, well, in, in company, which I couldn't really match. But she had one wonderful remark after Kennedy finished this great speech and there was on a half hour of demonstration, um, you know, his great supporters and so on. And afterwards, when we were off air, she turned around and she said, why? She said, that was a wonderful speech, a truly wonderful speech. I sure hope nothing happens to that boy. I thought, well, they don't make him like that anymore. But what, ha what then happened, and the story is a chronology, was of course the Reagan era. And to me, as I try to explain in the book, as somebody who had first seen America during the schism of Vietnam, the loss of faith that had followed the turmoil of the 60s, and then the catastrophe of Watergate, which destroyed faith in the electoral system. Reagan came along in that famous ad in his second election campaign, It's Morning in America Again in 84. He seemed to have stepped off a rocking chair on a porch in a Norman Rockwell painting, and to say as the grandfatherly figure, it's okay, I'm here. Now it wasn't okay. I mean, he was up and down, he was unpopular at the beginning, his second administration from 84 to 88 was mired in scandal, Iran Contra and so on. And yet Reagan left the White House with this image of a greater America, somehow imprinted on the country and on his presidency, partly because he always seemed to stand aside from his own presidency. Everybody knew that he wasn't, to put it politely, a master of detail. Uh, when Margaret Thatcher paid her first visit, of course, she was thrilled to have a man who broadly shared her philosophy in the White House. <laughs> she said to her foreign secretary after their meeting, Lord Carrington, over a glass of whiskey in the government hospitality room across Lafayette Square, Peter, she said, referring to Lord Carrington, and she tapped her head and said, there's nothing there about Reagan. But of course, it was useful to her. He played the game in the Falklands. They agreed on all kinds of things. And for her, in the liaison with Gorbachev, which had come about largely because of the information provided uh, to the United States by Oleg Gordievsky, MI6's great spy at the heart of the Russian regime, they formed an implacable alliance. And what Reagan did for America, always underestimated, it seems to me here, was to do two things. One, give it a self-confidence, a feeling of self-confidence, despite all the mistakes and, uh, you know, disasters in many ways of his administration. Um, and secondly, to lay the foundations for a powerful conservative movement, which had always been a fringe in the Republican Party, which of course came back in the 90s through the weird figure of Newt Gingrich and subsequently gave us Donald Trump. And what I try to do in the book is to take this through the melodrama of the Clinton years, uh, Monica Lewinsky and the famous blue dress, Clinton's impeachment, he was cleared in the Senate, of course. And that period, which was economically very successful, but which somehow cut away again at America's feeling of self-confidence because they didn't believe that they should have to face the extraordinarily sordid details of the president's dalliances in a room just off the Oval Office. And however much many of them might have liked Clinton and forgiven him, they didn't want it. And when Bush George W. came along, the son of a president, and said, I am a compassionate conservative, that seemed to do something to heal, at the time, the wounds. Because on the one hand, he was of a conservative bent, but he was the son of his father, who was a liberal Republican, who didn't believe in sort of wild Gingrichite theories. And he seemed to kind of settle something that had gone a little awry after the Clinton years. Although, of course, the election in which he got to the White House uh, 
had been one in which Al Gore came within a few hundred votes and probably should have won it in Florida. And what I tried to do in the book is just tell the extraordinary melodrama of that time and the election of Bush. And then, of course, 9-11. And the relationship between Bush and Blair, which became one that was uh, uh, almost uh, uh, impossible to describe because it had psychological longing on both sides, which was very hard to put your finger on, but which drew Blair into the ambit, not as some kind of uh, simple-minded poodle, I think that's always been a wrong reading of it, but certainly someone who decided fundamentally that his mind was made up and he would be with the Americans wherever they went. And of course, it led politically for him to the catastrophe of the Iraq war. And that takes us then really to the modern era, to the election of Obama, the most extraordinary election campaign any American had seen, to watch a black candidate coming up as I did those last few days through the deep south, to come to Washington and then go home to Chicago, almost certainly as the man who would win. In a country which, when I got there for the first time, the trains had been segregated um, only five years before I set foot in Washington for the first time, when a train came from New York that was heading across the Potomac to Virginia, black passengers had to get out and go to the back cars, which of course were more uncomfortable than the front ones. So we had the Obama period and then the reaction. Then everything that had boiled up in America in the last 45 years seemed to come to some new kind of amalgam of passion in the election of Donald Trump. It was the most remarkable thing, partly because picking up on Margaret's theme, it was one that really nobody had expected until the last few days. And then he arrived. And what was he? Well, of course, he was the disruptor. And one image that I recall with um, very strong feelings from that campaign was an appearance he made with the great disruptor who was working in politics at home when uh, a very familiar figure turned up at rallies and they embraced each other and talked about the way that he, Nigel Farage and Donald Trump would together slam everything that people had come to recognize as the way things should be, whether it was the United Nations, uh, European Union, uh, international systems of defense and economic cooperation, anything. It was all going out the window. And anyone who thought Trump wouldn't do it and wouldn't carry it through didn't understand this man. I remember meeting and talking with several times during the campaign, Anthony Scaramucci, the mooch as we called him, who subsequently became very uncomfortably for four days. He didn't last very long, even by the standard of Trump communications directors, uh, communications head at the White House. And he told me, having excoriated Trump when we first met, he didn't believe he would do it. He didn't believe he should become the candidate. He thought he was a fake and a flake. But he finally came around and was raising money for him. And I saw him about three days before the election. And he said, I think we're going to win. And I said, I don't believe you. And he said, well, I think we are, although I don't think he believed it either. And he said, as he walked me to the elevator in his office in uh, New York, he said, I'll tell you one thing, though. Donald has assured me that if he is elected, there will be no more tweets. Now, I remember that three or four times a day. So we got Trump and they got what they voted for. And there is a base there which is extraordinarily um, loyal, which as somebody put it to me, if you lined up 50 Russian prostitutes on television, not on Fox News, and said, these are women that the President of the United States has you know, slept with in the last two years. I'm not suggesting that anything like that is remotely near the truth. They would say, well, that doesn't matter. We buy that because we buy Donald Trump. We want the guy who's going to go in there and shake things up and everything else is for the birds. And this explains the conundrum, which I think many people in our country find it very hard to accept, that the evangelical movement, which came into being on the right of American politics in the later years of Reagan, uh, in the late 80s, became a formidable political force. Why would someone who is a Bible-believing 
literal Bible-believing evangelical Christian support Donald Trump? Well, the answer is Trump says, I will appoint the judges who do what you want. Forget about my business dealings. Forget about my private life. Forget about the tape about me touching women just because I was a powerful man. Don't you worry. I will give you the judges you want. And that's enough. But, and here is the but, that base, the base as they all call it in the States, it's substantial, but it ain't a majority. And Donald Trump's popularity, thanks to the virus, has taken a huge hit. I think it was going down anyway, inexorably. And he's got a big fight. We'll leave Joe Biden for another day. But what comes back to me in this story, which took me to the States in 1970, which allowed me to come back as a journalist, as a, a student, as a traveler, a holiday maker, if you like, uh, was this constant theme of the question of the fragility of ceaselessly into the past. They still want to hold on to it. They still believe it's there, but it's fractured and its absence is painful. I'm haunted by words that I've put on the frontispiece of the book, actually, by Alistair Cook, the master observer of America. At the end of his great series, on America for the BBC uh, in television in 1972, he looked at the camera, almost the last shot in the film, having surveyed the whole history of the country and said this, in this land of the most persistent idealism and the blandest cynicism, the race is on between its decadence and its vitality. And that's why I called the last chapter of the book, Decadence and Vitality. And the Trump presidency is why I called the previous chapter a culture of contempt, because I think as a matter of observation, not an opinion, that is what he's brought to politics. You do down your opponent, you scorn your enemies, you don't seek compromise, you seek division as a matter of political operation. Thank you. And that is the Trump we now know. It's the Trump who is fighting for re-election. He is the most extraordinary president of our lifetimes. Will he be elected? Probably not. But to pick up Margaret's theme about uncertainty, no one knows. And for me, this journey, which I've described over half a century, continues. Thank and you. that is why it's an exciting one.